welcome to Stories from the NNI. I'm Lisa Friedersdorf, Director of the National Nanotechnology Coordination Office. Today, it's my pleasure to welcome Dan Roxbury, Assistant Professor of Chemical Engineering at the University of Rhode Island. Dan, thank you so much for joining us today. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started in nanotechnology? Sure. Thank you very much for having me today. And, you know, I wanted to say that I've always been interested in, in science growing up uh, since, since early childhood. I've always taken things apart and tried to reconstruct them. I wanted to invent things, uh, make things that would help people, and eventually on a large scale. And so my introduction to nanotechnology really came in college. I went to Lehigh University for my bachelor in chemical engineering. I got introduced to the field of nanotechnology. I, I got to work on carbon nanotubes, especially. So I, I hadn't really heard of those too much, you know, before. But I thought, uh, you know, these these are fascinating little nanoscale devices, materials, and really just trying to see what we can do with those. So I understand your current research is focused on biosensors. Can you tell us a little bit about that? So, you know, biosensors is a very broad topic, very uh, large, uh, large area. In terms of what we're interested in, so we are creating biosensors that can be used in a live cell or a live animal and eventually up to a person, either implanted into a person or, you know, on a wearable device. We're interested in detecting small quantities of what's known as biomarkers. Now, these biomarkers can be proteins, they can be chemicals, and they're also indicative of different disease conditions. Can you talk a little bit about the materials that you're using in these sensors? Sure. And that's kind of where my background and specialty come into play because, you know, these new types of biosensors that we're developing, they're using these nanomaterials that I had been researching and were really applying these now in a really usable fashion. So some of these nanomaterials have very interesting optical properties. That's really what we're trying to exploit. So actually, we can use these to our advantage by designing biosensors that optically respond to the biomarkers. So the biomarkers, again, can be the proteins, it can be a chemical. And so if we can detect these biomarkers at a very low level and really non-invasively, that's really the goal there, we can use that signal to accurately diagnose a disease condition. What you're describing is instead of perhaps taking a blood draw and looking for biomarkers in the blood, you're using a physical sensor that responds optically that gives you that reading without having to do a blood draw, for instance? So that's exactly it. Yeah. So actually, I mean, there's really two main ways we can look at this. So either the nanosensor can be in direct contact, let's say implanted into a patient, an at-risk patient perhaps. And really, if it's in contact with the bloodstream, we can have the protein directly diffuse, let's say, into the device that holds the nanosensor, and then we can optically read out that concentration. The other way, which actually is a bit more non-invasive, is if we incorporate the nanosensor in some type of wearable device. And so, you know, my lab currently is looking more into ways to uh, doing this, and actually we can encapsulate the nanosensor in a smart bandage type of fashion. And so these smart bandages can then be worn by the patients on wounds. And, and actually, we can monitor the status of the wound and if there's infections in the wounds. Well, that's very interesting. It sounds to me like you're talking about materials and optics, which I always consider as physics. You've got biology with the signal. You probably have electrical engineering, and you mentioned you're a chemical engineer. So it seems like this project is really interdisciplinary. Can you talk a little bit about that? Absolutely. At a fundamental level, we need to be collaborating with all of these different types of disciplines. And at the University of Rhode Island, actually, I'm in a really good position because our College of Engineering is located basically in the same large building. I have electrical engineers, I have mechanical engineers, we have a pharmacy school that I can collaborate with. And really, the interdisciplinary nature of this project. It just, it allows us to make these collaborations and really look at the important biological questions. And I think that's the most important thing about this. You know, we have the tool, but we really, we have to find what is the new biological problem that we have to go after. 
And uh, that, I think that's really what we're doing right now in terms of making these smart bandages that can detect the infections, you know, in situ, non-invasively. So I want to zoom out from your research a little bit and get your perspective on nanotechnology more broadly. We're in the process of developing the next strategic plan for the NNI and looking at important accomplishments in the first 20 years and also where to focus in the future. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on first where you think nanotechnology has had impacts so far and also where you see the most promising areas areas to pursue into the future. I think I have a little bit of a bias here because most of my work is in the carbon nanomaterials sector. And just looking within there, I can think of three main discoveries. So there was the, the buckyball, the fullerenes, there was the multi-wall carbon nanotube, and then there was graphene, right? And so really within the last, you know, kind of three decades, we've had three discoveries and we're still exploiting the, the properties of these materials and using them for these, you know, translational applications and and trying to bring these out to patients in a very uh, user-friendly fashion. And, you know, I, I, like I said, I'm a little biased there, but I, I do think there's, you know, there's so much more that we can tap into in, in terms of the potential of these materials. Moving forward, I'd, I'd say there's other materials that are coming into light now other than carbon-based materials, you know, other types of, of nanomaterials. And I think it's a very similar concept that, you know, there's the discovery and then there's really exploiting the properties for many different applications. You know, material science, you have biomedicine, you have chemistry, all kinds of really, really cool applications. We hit on interdisciplinarity a little bit, but I, I wanted to maybe explore that a little bit further with respect to students. And the students that you have in your lab, what advice do you share with them, especially if they've expressed interest in nanotechnology? That's a good point that you bring up. And actually, in my lab, I do have graduate students, I have undergraduates, and actually I have a couple high school students once in a while. And so my philosophy is the earlier that I can bring them into my lab and really get them hands-on experience, you know, with nanotechnology and, and laboratory experience, it really, it, I can just see the excitement that they have, you know. And for an undergrad, if I can get them in my lab in their freshman or sophomore year, that's just wonderful. And, then I, and you know, I can see how they're going to grow in the next couple of years. And, and actually, most of them go on and, and apply to graduate school. And so I'm just very happy to see them grow as they're, as they're in my lab. You mentioned that you have graduate students and undergraduates, but you also mentioned high school students, which is, which is not that common in, in university labs. Can you talk a little bit about your um, engagement with high school students? Absolutely. You know, I think this is something that not too many professors have the time to engage with. But since my, I'd say my second year as faculty at URI, I started a high school outreach program and I reached out to a, a local science teacher at one of the local high schools. And we developed this program where it's basically an eight-week program that we, we try to run every spring. You know, during the pandemic, we had to delay a little bit. But in terms of the actual program, I would go to the high school. I would teach them lessons about nanotechnology. I would teach them specifically what we're doing in my lab at URI and within Rhode Island. And even more so, I would give them the opportunity to devise a, an experiment. And so, you know, I would let them create a hypothesis. And so based on my research, it would be something like dispersing carbon nanotubes in a water solution and, and, and trying to see which one would be biocompatible. And so they would write up the research plan. They would come to my lab during our spring break. They would be in the lab for an entire day, and then they would perform the experiment. So they got really good hands-on experience. My graduate students would be there. They would be supervising the whole process. And then they wrote up their experiment. They wrote up their results. They created a poster. And then they would present that poster at the high school to their peers, and their parents would come. And it was, it was just a really good time. And so I've been involved in that program for about three years now. We have some NSF funding to continue this program for the foreseeable future. And so I, I really enjoy running this every year. So you mentioned your early interest in carbonaceous 
nanomaterials in the buckyball and carbon nanotubes and graphene. And these materials are seeing application exploiting a really wide variety of amazing properties. For carbon nanotubes, one of the applications in the early days was a space elevator, right? Using its mechanical strength. You see complex new architectures, 3D monolithic IC chips using carbon nanotubes because of their electrical properties. And here you're exploiting the optical properties. Can you share a little bit about how those different properties might play a role in in the sensors that you're developing? Our particular carbon nanotubes, they're unique for many different reasons. You know, the, the electronics, the mechanical, the optical. The optical is really the last to be exploited, you know, and, and I'd say within the last decade or so, we've been looking at the optical properties. But when they were first discovered, where they were first isolated, we knew that they had the, the mechanical strength. And that's just arises from the, the carbon locations. But the electronics properties, and, and you know, there's a lot of promise there in terms terms of quantum computing. I mean, that's outside my expertise, but I've just heard so much promise there and so many different really, really cool applications that could come out of that. There are also people making sensors based on the electronics properties. This would be more of the, the conductance of the carbon nanotube. It is it's a very similar type of approach where you would engineer maybe the surface of the nanotube to detect a particular protein. When that particular protein binds to the nanotube, it changes the conductance of, let's say, if this is in a film, you know, you would change the, the conductance of your film. If you look at what we're doing with the optical properties, so that nanotube does not have to be contacting any type of electric it doesn't have to be requiring any external power source. We're just going to take a laser, you know, in our lab, shine it on the nanotube. It's going to give us a readout in the near infrared, and that particular light that that gets emitted, it tells us the local environment around the nanotube, it, and it's going to tell us if there's a particular protein that we care about there, you know, and, and it can also tell us the concentration of that protein. So, you know, I think the optical properties, like I said, it's the, the last to be exploited, but it could have the most potential. You know, and it's, it's really just, it's a growing field right now, and we're just trying to see what we can do with it. And, you know, we have some demonstrated applications already, but I still think there's so much more to be done there. Dan, I've really enjoyed our conversation today, and I appreciate your time. Do you have any closing thoughts that you'd like to share with our listeners? Nano is still an exponentially growing field. I think in terms of the discoveries and the translation of the technology into a user-friendly format, there's still so much left to do. I'd say from a top-down approach, we need to not lose sight of these goals. We need to make sure that there's funding in place in order to pursue these discoveries. And I just think we just have to keep that in mind. What we're discovering right now, you can't buy this for the next 10, 15, 20 years, but it has to happen in order to continue that pipeline.